Eu vou chamar então primeiro o doutor, o doutor Diogo Basso. O Diogo vai falar sobre biomarcadores em câncer de próstata. Diogo, seja bem-vindo. Para cima, só para cima, Diogo. Muito obrigado pela, pela apresentação, todos os AID. Muito obrigado pela oportunidade. É bom ver uma sala cheia essa hora da manhã. Ah, e é um prazer estar aqui para discutir nos próximos 15 minutos um assunto que eu acho muito importante e fundamental nos dias de hoje, que é o desenvolvimento de biomarcadores no câncer de próstata a resistente à castração, e que a gente espera que no futuro vai nos ajudar a guiar e a selecionar o melhor, a melhor terapia para o paciente nos, nos diversos pontos da história natural da sua doença. Bom, então aqui estão meus conflitos de interesse. Bom, então como objetivos, nós vamos discutir os biomarcadores prognósticos que estão atualmente em uso na doença resistente à castração, escrever alguns biomarcadores preditivos que estão em estudo atualmente e algumas implicações relacionadas a esse desenvolvimento. Bom, então vocês todos conhecem esse slide, o slide que descreve a história natural do câncer de próstata, desde a doença localizada até a recorrência bioquímica, desenvolvimento de metástases, e esses pacientes, então, tratados com terapia de privação androgênica, vão acabar evoluindo para a doença resistente à castração. E nós temos hoje inúmeras drogas aprovadas num cenário de doença resistente à castração, como vocês sabem, então, a beraterona e a exalutamida, que são novos agentes hormonais. Nós temos quimioterapia com doce taxel e cabase taxel, e radiofármaco, ah, o chofigo, né, o rádio 223. Nos Estados Unidos ainda ah, existe a opção do cipuléu seu T, um tipo de imunoterapia que nós não temos no Brasil. E a nossa grande dificuldade hoje é como incorporar todos esses tratamentos de forma sequencial no paciente. Ou seja, a gente não sabe qual é a melhor sequência de terapias ah, para um determinado paciente. Então, ah, vou dar dois exemplos de casos muito parecidos. Então, observem pacientes ao redor dos seus 60 e poucos anos que tiveram uma doença recidivada, ah, com doença metastática, receberam hormonioterapia e evoluíram com doença resistente à castração. Esse paciente tem a ah, doença extensa, somente um discreto desconforto no quadril, enquanto o outro paciente tem dor já significativa, já tem um performance comprometido. Então, para os dois pacientes, nós temos essas opções de tratamento. E a verdade é que nós não temos um único teste que vai nos ajudar a definir qual que é o melhor tratamento para ambos. Se a gente for utilizar os critérios de inclusão dos estudos clínicos, então para esse paciente que tem doença pouco sintomática, nós vamos dar preferência ao uso de abiraterona ou enzalutamida. E para um paciente com doença mais sintomática, em geral se dá preferência ao uso de quimioterapia. Mas do ponto de vista biológico isso não faz tanto sentido. Provavelmente esse paciente tem um volume maior de doença, não significa que ele não irá responder aos novos tratamentos hormonais. Então o que de fato nós precisamos são biomarcadores para nos ajudar a entender a biologia dessas doenças, e assim poder selecionar o melhor tratamento. Bom, nós temos dois tipos principais de biomarcadores, existem outras categorias de biomarcadores, mas esses são os dois tipos principais. Nós temos os biomarcadores prognósticos, que vão nos dizer a história natural da doença, independente do tratamento. E nós temos os biomarcadores preditivos, que podem ser testes ou fatores que vão nos ajudar a escolher um determinado tratamento ou a não escolher um determinado tratamento. Então, por exemplo... Ah, em câncer de próstata, nós temos uma lista grande de biomarcadores prognósticos já validados. Então, por exemplo, o LDH é um dos principais biomarcadores de mal prognóstico, o próprio PSA, contagem de célula circulante tumoral e uma série de outros biomarcadores que eu vou mostrar ah, mais à frente. Ah, mas, infelizmente, nós não temos bons biomarcadores preditivos para nos ajudar a escolher o melhor tratamento. Talvez um dos, um dos mais recentes, é a presença de instabilidade de microsatélite, como vocês sabem, hoje existe já uma aprovação nos Estados Unidos para o uso de pembrolizumab para esse grupo de pacientes. Mas infelizmente, ontem foi discutido na sessão de próstata, somente 2 a 3% dos pacientes com câncer de próstata têm instabilidade de microsatélite. Então é uma população muito pequena que vai acabar se beneficiando dessa indicação. Existem vários outros biomarcadores preditivos que estão em estudo, um dos mais avançados é o ARV7, que eu vou discutir mais à frente, mas também mutações do receptor de andrógeno, e o que está muito, ah, no momento, chamando muita atenção são as alterações nos genes de reparo do DNA, que talvez venham a ser biomarcadores preditivos para o uso de inibidor de PARP, e talvez até para imunoterapia. Bom, então, em relação a biomarcadores prognósticos, então, 
Há ah, dois anos atrás foi publicado esse paper muito interessante, avaliando dois biomarcadores prognósticos. Um ah, é a presença de célula circulante tumoral ah, no sangue periférico e a outra é a contagem de DHL. Então foi criado um painel e observem que quando você tem pacientes com alta contagem de célula circulante tumoral e DHL elevado, ah, perdão, está ao contrário aqui, mas enfim, ah, pacientes com baixa contagem de células circulante tumoral e DHL baixo, esses pacientes tendem a ir melhor. Pacientes com alta contagem de ah, células circulante tumoral e um DHL baixo, ah, perdão, alta contagem de DHL alto tendem a ir pior e o contrário, os pacientes têm melhor prognóstico. E também em relação aos sítios de doença metastática, então, um trabalho muito interessante, com um N bastante grande de, de pacientes, mostrou que pacientes que têm doença linfonodal exclusiva tendem a ter melhor prognóstico do que pacientes com metástase hepática, que tendem a ter pior prognóstico. Pacientes com doença óssea têm um prognóstico intermediário. E interessante, a gente fala muito em doença visceral, mas parece que pacientes que têm metástase pulmonar ah, somente, ah, e podem ter outros tipos de metástases que não fígado, parecem ter um prognóstico parecido com pacientes com doença óssea. Outro estudo muito interessante avaliou uma série de biomarcadores de pacientes incluídos em vários estudos clínicos. E eles desenvolveram esse, esse gráfico uh, muito interessante. E quanto maior é o tamanho desse círculo, maior é o impacto prognóstico do biomarcador analisado. Então, observem que nesse, nesse estudo, o LDH foi um dos biomarcadores prognósticos mais associados a pior desfecho, assim como a hemoglobina e a, a aspartato aminotransferase. Observem que o PSA, de fato, tem um papel como biomarcador prognóstico menor, comparado a esses outros. Bom, agora eu vou discutir um pouco dos, uh, bio, do, dos mecanismos de resistência à castração uh, e onde está se estudando muito a identificação dos biomarcadores que podem ser preditivos a tratamentos da doença. Então, o que a gente sabe desses pacientes, então, paciente evoluindo com doença resistente à castração, é que uma parcela dos pacientes não responde às novas terapias hormonais. Isso é verdade para a enzalutamida, isso é verdade para a viraterona. Então, apesar do grande número de pacientes que são respondedores e se beneficiam desses tratamentos, uma parcela significativa dos pacientes não se beneficia. Então, de fato, seria muito importante que nós tivéssemos uh, um biomarcador para saber quem são esses pacientes, para que a gente possa utilizar tratamentos mais eficazes para essa população. Então, se a gente pensar na célula do câncer de próstata, a via normal de sinalização androgênica, então, começa aqui pela conversão de testosterona em diidrotestosterona. A diidrotestosterona entra na célula, se liga ao receptor de andrógeno, que se dimeriza, migra para o núcleo e ativa, então, uma cascata de sinalização. E vários genes vão ser, então, a, a, transcritos, a, que vão levar à proliferação celular, desenvolvimento de metástases e etc. E aqui eu já tenho três possíveis a, mecanismos de resistência à castração. Então, o primeiro é síntese, síntese extragonadal de testosterona, então isso é um mecanismo muito conhecido. O segundo é produção intratumoral de, de andrógeno. E o terceiro é uma hiperexpressão do, do receptor de andrógeno. Então, são três mecanismos que nós chamamos de dependente ah, do ligante, ou seja, são mecanismos em que ah, surge mais testosterona ou surge uma, um número maior de receptores e isso vai, então, gerar a resistência à castração nesse paciente. Nós temos alguns outros mecanismos que eles são independentes do andrógeno, mas são dependentes uh, do, receptor de do receptor de andrógeno. Então nós temos outras vias que acabam ativando o receptor de andrógeno. Nós temos uma via uh, que está sendo muito estudada, que é a presença das variantes splicing do receptor de andrógeno, principalmente a variante 7. Uh, e eu vou discutir um pouco mais à frente sobre ela. Nós temos mutações do receptor de andrógeno que transformam esse receptor ah, para ele passar a ser ativado, por exemplo, pela própria enzalutamida, por corticoide, por progesterona. Então são, são alterações do receptor e esse receptor passa a não ser mais ativado por andrógeno e sim por outras moléculas. E nós temos ainda a, o que nós chamamos de AR bypass signaling. O que, que é isso? Então a, 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 o, a cascata de sinalização androgênica passa a ocorrer através de outros receptores, como por exemplo o receptor de glicocorticoide ou receptor de progesterona. Então, por mais que você bloqueie o receptor de andrógeno, se o paciente está recebendo corticoide, então ele pode ativar ah, essa via do receptor de, de glicocorticoide e essa célula vai continuar proliferando, produzindo PSA e levando à proliferação celular. 
Vamos falar um pouco sobre as variantes splicing do receptor de andrógeno. Então, como vocês sabem, essas variantes elas não apresentam o domínio de ligação do andrógeno. E é uma variante que fica constitucionalmente ativa. Então, você, independente da presença ou não do andrógeno, a, a, esse receptor ele vai continuar ativo, vai continuar levando a sinalização da, da cascata androgênica. Ah, bom, isso já é um dado um pouco antigo, foi bastante discutido ontem na sessão de próstata. Esse foi o primeiro estudo que avaliou 62 pacientes, 31 pacientes tratados com exalutamida, 31 pacientes tratados com abiraterona, e mostrou pela primeira vez que pacientes que têm a presença dessa variante tendem a ter uma resposta pior. Né? Então, se a gente pegar aqui os pacientes com RV7 positivos, observem que a grande maioria deles não apresentou queda de PSA, e eles tendem a ter uma pior sobrevida livre de progressão e uma pior sobrevida global com relação aos pacientes que não apresentam, não apresentam essas células. O mesmo foi verdade com a biraterona. Observem que os pacientes ARV7 negativos, eles estão basicamente todos ah, aqui, né, nesse, no, no, no forest plot, mostrando que esses pacientes têm uma maior chance de responder. Enquanto se vocês observarem os pacientes que não apresentaram declínio de PSA, eles estão basicamente aqui concentrados com os pacientes ARV7 positivos. Essa série foi atualizada recentemente, esse ano, com um pouco mais de 200 pacientes. O que os autores identificaram foi, na verdade, um terceiro subgrupo ah, avaliado. Então, eles dividiram os pacientes em pacientes que não apresentavam célula circulante tumoral detectável, pacientes que apresentavam célula circulante detectável, mas eram ARV7 negativos, e os pacientes que tinham ambos, ou seja, eles tinham a célula circulante tumoral e eram ARV7 positivos. Então, observem que a chance de resposta, seja com a beraterona ou exalutamida, para o primeiro grupo foi bastante alta, né? quase 80%, no grupo intermediário de 50% e nesse grupo em torno de 13%. Bom, antes se imaginava que nenhum paciente RV7 positivo responderia a essas drogas. Né? Então, muito se discutiu em relação a esses, alguns pacientes que responderam. E a verdade é que alguns desses pacientes receberam radioterapia, e ontem se discutiu que alguns pacientes têm, parece clones diferentes, algumas células que não têm o RV7, mas outras células que têm o RV7. Então, talvez isso explique um pouco da resposta por PSA. O Dr. Anton Araques, que é o principal autor desse estudo, ele veio aqui para o nosso evento e ontem nós discutimos que ele disse que esses pacientes que responderam, em verdade, responderam por um curto período de tempo. Então, é muito provável que, apesar do declínio do PSA, eles não tiveram benefício com o uso dessas drogas. E quando a gente observa desfechos mais importantes em relação à sobrevida global e sobrevida livre de progressão, a gente observa que os grupos se comportam de forma muito diferente. Então, os pacientes que têm célula circulante detectável com a presença da, da, dessa variante 7 têm os piores desfechos e, de fato, parecem não se beneficiar nem do uso de abiraterona ou exalutamida. Esses dados ainda são preliminares, ou seja, a gente precisa de estudos prospectivos para confirmar esse dado, mas é um dado muito, muito provocador. Bom, e a pergunta subsequente foi, bom, se, essa, se a presença da variante 7 se correlaciona à resistência com a beraterona e a exalutamida, será que esses pacientes respondem à quimioterapia? Então esse foi um estudo feito pelo mesmo grupo, da Johns Hopkins, e o que eles mostraram é que tanto faz. Né? Observem que dos respondedores, vocês vão encontrar pacientes ARV7 positivos ou negativos. Então parece que para quimioterapia com taxano, independe se o paciente tem ou não a presença da variante 7, todos eles parecem que respondem igual. Ah, e quando eles foram avaliar, então aqui, ah, na verdade é uma comparação dos pacientes ARV7 positivos tratados com taxano ou com abiraterona ou exalutamida, observem que houve uma diferença em sobrevida livre de progressão, mas chama a atenção que esse é um, um subgrupo de prognóstico muito ruim, observem as curvas, mesmo tratados com quimioterapia, basicamente todo mundo progride em poucos meses. Ah, nos pacientes ARV7 negativos, parece que realmente não há diferença se você usar quimioterapia ou abiraterona e exalutamida. De novo, esse é um dado retrospectivo, uma série grande, mas retrospectiva e ainda geradora de hipótese. Mas isso pode levar à mudança do nosso, do, da forma com que a gente trata os pacientes. Então esse algoritmo foi publicado no editorial uh, no Annals of Oncology uh, há dois anos atrás e é muito interessante. Então o que, o que é sugerido, o que é possível que venha a acontecer no futuro é que um paciente evoluindo com doença resistente à castração você vai fazer então uma biópsia líquida e avaliar a presença do RV7. Se esse paciente for RV7 negativo, ele pode receber a beraterona ou a exalutamida. 
Quando ele progride, você avalia de novo. E se ele for ne continuar negativo, você pode usar o outro uh, inibidor hormonal. Se em algum momento ele for positivo, a impressão é que quimioterapia com doce taxel ou com a base taxel parece que vai trazer os melhores desfechos. Um estudo que, que foi uh, desenvolvido, e é um estudo que parecia ser muito promissor, com uma droga chamada galeterona, essa é uma droga que já se discutiu bastante, tem um, três mecanismos de ação, é inibidor da, da CEP17, é um antagonista do receptor de andrógeno e também tem um mecanismo de degradar o receptor de andrógeno. Então, era uma droga que poderia ter atividade antitumoral contra as células ARV7 positivas. Então, o estudo queria selecionar os pacientes ARV7 positivos para tratamento com galeterona ou enzalutamida. É um estudo que muitos acreditavam que a galeterona seria superior, mas esse estudo foi negativo, totalmente negativo. Primeiro porque a incidência da, da, do RV7 nessa população que foi screenada para o estudo foi baixa, foi menor do que esperado, em torno de 8%. Uh, inicialmente, 38 pacientes foram tratados, mas o estudo foi terminado porque era muito improvável que atingiria o endpoint primário. Uh, uh, houve uma, uma taxa muito alta de, de, de progressão de doença precoce uh, e alguns pacientes do grupo de enzalotamida responderam. Então, de fato, um estudo que acabou desapontando a comunidade em relação a essa droga. Bom, vou falar rapidamente de algumas mutações uh, do receptor de andrógeno. Isso é um mecanismo de ação, uh, desculpa, mecanismo de resistência a algumas drogas. Então, nós temos algumas mutações, como eu falei para vocês, que tornam o receptor uh, potencialmente ativado por glicorticoide, bicalutamida, progesterona, entre outros. Então, é possível que no futuro isso seja incorporado num teste só de biópsia líquida, uh, que também é muito interessante. Bom, vou falar rapidamente de outras vias. Isso a gente discutiu dois anos atrás nesse mesmo simpósio, especialmente em relação aos genes de reparo de DNA, isso é um tema cada vez mais atual. E esse estudo que foi apresentado também há dois anos atrás, um estudo com olaparib em pacientes com câncer de próstata resistentes à castração, todos os pacientes foram submetidos à biópsia antes do tratamento, e o que se viu de forma muito interessante era que os pacientes que tinham alguma, algum defeito nessa via tinham uma alta chance de responder a olaparib, enquanto pacientes que não tinham nenhuma, nenhum defeito nessa via, a chance de responder era muito baixa. Né? E aqui está listado todos os genes associados, e o que chama a atenção é que tanto alterações somáticas quanto alterações germinativas pareciam predizer benefício a essas drogas. Então hoje a gente tem uma série de estudos que estão em andamento com inibidor de PARP na doença resistente à castração, aqui alguns deles, então, o estudo Profound, que vai comparar o olaparib com a exalutamida nessa população, ah, então parece que uma população que não é desprezível, até 15% a 20% dos pacientes podem ter alguma alteração da via de reparo, ah, e isso, o, o desfecho desses pacientes pode mudar com a incorporação de novas drogas, e a gente pode ter aqui, então, talvez o primeiro biomarcador para selecionar terapias para um paciente com doença avançada. Bom, então como conclusões, nós temos muitos biomarcadores prognósticos para a doença, então a gente tem a capacidade sim de definir prognóstico no paciente com doença resistente à castração, mas, infelizmente, nos dias de hoje, a gente ainda utiliza fatores clínicos para determinar o tratamento. Então, a presença de dor, performance status, doença visceral, etc. Como eu falei para vocês, o RV7 pode ser detectado em célula circulante tumoral e parece estar associado à resistência primária à beraterona e exalutamida e pode vir a ser um biomarcador para selecionar terapias nesse contexto. Há algumas mutações, então, como eu já mencionei, parecem estar associadas à resistência adquirida, e se a gente consegue detectar essas mutações de forma mais precoce, a gente pode mudar o tratamento dos pacientes uh, e talvez ter melhores desfechos uh, do tratamento. Né? E como eu já mencionei, a inibição da, da PARP parece ser uma estratégia muito interessante para os pacientes que têm defeito da via do DNA. E eu pessoalmente acredito que esses estudos vão ser positivos e que esses inibidores vão ser incorporados ao nosso arsenal terapêutico do tratamento da doença. Então com isso eu queria finalizar e partir para a nossa discussão dos casos. Muito obrigado. Fica com o microfone dois segundos, just to ask a few questions, Anthony, if you don't mind, or the debaters as well, if you want to have any questions or comments. Um, would you use in your practice, if you had liquid biopsy very easily, very wealthy patient, would you use your RV7 detection as a guideline, particularly now in light of this new paper you just mentioned, like 8 out of 15 or 7 out of 15 responded, in the presence of AR, 
ARV7. Would you use that in your practice? And then Anthony would like to ask you the same question. Diogo. Então, ontem, ontem eu fiz essa mesma pergunta para o Dr. Emanuel Antonarax, que é o principal autor Natural. do paper. Do New England. Eu fiz uma pergunta específica. Eu perguntei, bom, se você tem um paciente que estava em hormonoterapia e progrediu a doença, ele não recebeu nenhuma terapia para doença resistente à castração, paciente com baixo volume de doença, assintomático, e que você faz uma biópsia líquida e ele vem a RV7 positivo. Né? Então, esse é um paciente que nós trataríamos com a biraterona ou a exalutamida normalmente. Exato. E o que ele me respondeu foi muito interessante. Ele acredita que sim, que nos dias de hoje eles têm utilizado o ARV7 para selecionar tratamento. Eu pessoalmente acho que ainda é cedo, a gente não tem a validação, tem alguns ah. pacientes que respondem, uh, e a gente não tem o teste comercialmente disponível aqui no Brasil. Guardant pega? Não, o então, Guardant 360 pega? Você não, sabe não. não Seria só especificamente aquela é, mutação. Porque precisa ah. ser um teste que vai avaliar Bem RNA. específico. É, então tá. nenhum teste de sequenciamento de tá. DNA vai detectar. Tá. Então nos Estados Unidos existe um teste que está comercialmente disponível, e alguns centros têm utilizado como seleção de pacientes, okay. foi o que ele me, me comentou ontem. Não sei o que Anthony, você quer comentar no microfone? Sim, uh, yes. well, há um teste disponível nos Estados Unidos, mas não é fácil para nós acessar esse teste. Uh, it's it's mailed to Dr. Antonakis's laboratory, uh, and the results come back in a in a manner that uh, doesn't often help us from a timely standpoint. Uh, I would offer that the ARV7 uh, becomes a prognostic marker more than a predictive marker, uh, because even in patients who receive chemotherapy, it's prognostically worse, albeit better than androgen receptor modifying agents. Uh, I am more inclined to understand if patients have DNA repair defect mutations at the onset. I think that does have more of an impact in regards to therapeutic uh, interventions in, and results. Dr. Mega, are you checking uh, microsatellite instability in all your uh, CRPC patients to try to offer them pembrolizumab? Uh, based on the, this is a landmark FDA indication. Uh, first, it is one in which we are using a biomarker to define the therapy. Uh, and now that the FDA has acted upon pembrolizumab uh, in regards to people with microsatellite instability, then across all my GU malignancies, I will be testing for microsatellite instability. <coughs> Quer fazer alguma pergunta, Não. Ok. Dr. Mega, would you kindly? Uh, Dr. Mega agora vai falar sobre o tumor de próstata oligometastático. O passador de slide está ali na frente, Joe. The, the thing to move the side of the device. There we go. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation to be here this morning uh, in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, I appreciate that and, uh, and it's been my pleasure. Uh, to be here. Uh, I would like to be speaking about oligometastatic uh, prostate cancer. I'm from Brown University in uh, Providence, Rhode Island. My disclaimers, uh, consultant for Estellas, Bayer Pharmaceuticals, and Santa Fe Aventus. The definition of oligometastatic prostate cancer is a, a place that we should start. It has to be castrate sensitive, sensitive, and we see from the previous discussion that visceral metastasis are prognostically poor, especially liver metastasis, so no visceral metastasis, in less than four metastatic sites. This was a similar definition that, that uh, aggregated, uh, uh, disaggregated patients in the charted study. Um, But could it also include people with just regional lymph node positive disease? Or this entity called biochemical relapse disease, or truly in the context that there is no M0 disease uh, in patients who have a steadily rising PSA uh, after they are treated uh, with prostate cancer. But I want to focus on the low volume metastatic disease as we move forward with our discussion. 
why discuss oligometastatic uh, prostate cancer in a different light? Well, one would be this concept that there is a stepwise progression of cancer in that in early metastasis, there may not be an accumulation of mutations that could lead to prognostically worse cancer, such as we saw with the ARV7 uh, mutation. And it is this intermediate step biology in which more intensive oligometastatic directed therapy may impact overall prognosis. Now, let me be clear that this is just thought-provoking work as we move through to the future, that there have not been randomized clinical trials that clearly define what should be the pattern of treatment in regards to oligometastatic disease. However, there is some enticing data that states that we should think about it in a bit of a different manner. Well, one of the first uh, points that I want to make is how disappointing standard imaging is in the detection of metastatic prostate cancer in people who are at early failure, those M0 biochemical patients. However, thankfully, that is changing. Conventional imaging uh, in regards uh, to bone scans, less than 5% was shown to be positive in a review that now is almost 20 years old, but we still use bone scans frequently with people who have PSAs that are much less than 40. CT scans have a, a similar disappointing rate of predictability of uh, metastasis uh, in regards to patients who undergo, uh, who have had a biochemical failure. Recently approved uh, is the fluciclovine PET scan. What is fluciclovine? It is a radio-labeled amino acid. And so it looks at amino acid transport into tumor cells. What distinguishes it from FDG PET scans? Well, one is that it's not excreted through the urinary system, so we don't have enhancement within the kidney or the bladder. The other is that there is no CNS uptake like we see with FDG PET scans. And what drove the, the approval was this recently uh, published study by Bach Gansmo and colleagues in which 596 patients underwent these PET scans at various clinical sites, and the detection rates were 67%, and they found metastatic involvement in 26% of the patients. And now we can see that even at very low PSAs, this is a PSA of 0 0.8 nanograms per milliliter, that approximately 40% of the patients had detection of disease, some of them within the prostate bed and some of them extra prostatic. And as one would expect, we can see that as PSA rises, we can see the detection rates rise also to the point where as we get to a PSA above six, that we have nearly 85% detection rate. That is obviously much better than the previous pool data that I showed in regards to CT scans and bone scans. This is an example of a patient uh, that was published with a PSA of 0 0.4 milligrams the patient also had uh, a gr group grade 5 prostate cancer, and this is his fluciclovine PET scan, which shows a presacral lymph node and a skeletal metastasis within the acetabulum. Prior to fluciclovine PET scans, I was commonly using choline PET scans. However, choline PET scans could be done only in a limited number of centers because it required a cyclotron to be there available soon after the imaging given the rapid deterioration of 11 choline PET. The meta-analysis also showed that choline PET scans and sodium fluoride PET scans were better than standard CT scans and bone scans. 
And when we look at this meta-analysis of over 1,500 patients, we can see that the pool sensitivity for all sites of disease was 85%, and the pool specificity was 92%. The predictors were PSA greater than 1, a velocity greater than 1, in a PSA doubling time of less than three months. So where does the future with PET scans lead us to? I believe that with the advancement of imaging, the current patients that we are defining with oligometastatic disease will be classified as higher burden disease and will move out of that category. But behind it, replacing them, will be patients that we are have with a high-risk local prostate cancer and biochemical prostate cancers. Where these scans are not yet approved is to take that high-risk patient at the onset, a patient that's presenting uh, with a PSA of greater than 20 or Gleason 910 disease or palpable disease and staging them initially with PET scan. Obviously, I do see that there potentially is value there, and I think that there's going to be a subset of those patients who will be defined with metastatic disease and some of them with oligometastatic disease. But what do we do with these groups of patients? There are interesting medical questions. Should it be intermittent versus continuous ADT? Should we be adding chemotherapy as per the charted in Stampede data, or androgen receptor agents at the onset? Should we be managing local disease more aggressively, either with prostatectomy or performing more extended lymph node dissections? And how about stereotactic radiosurgery to target multi-site disease that is with, with outside of the local region? Now to the answer in regards to intermittent androgen deprivation therapy versus continuous androgen deprivation therapy. This study was pool data in regards to Hussein's recently published article in the New England Journal, which did show that intermittent androgen deprivation therapy was inferior to continuous androgen deprivation therapy in all patients with metastatic disease. The data wasn't disaggregated, but as I stated, approximately 50% had the minimal disease criteria by SWOG, which was similar to the definition that I had given. And we can see that the median survival benefit was approximately a half a year longer in people with continuous androgen deprivation therapy. Why was this a failed non-inferiority study? And we can see here uh, that 1.20% or 1.2 hazard ratio, that it was crossed in almost every subset of patient. However, even with that stated, uh, we, can, we often use intermittent androgen deprivation therapy in our practice, and especially with patients with oligometastatic disease, because it is often a patient preference. And in fact, there is some quality of life data and skeletal health data that would support the use of intermittent androgen deprivation therapy. Where there is no data is to support it is that it delays time to resistance. Well, how about chemotherapy in oligometastatic disease? Certainly an accepted practice in patients with high burden metastatic disease based on both the charted and stampede data. But I do want to call attention to the volume of metastasis in this area of the plot. And we can see that we have not yet reached clinical significance in patients with low volume disease in Dr. Sweeney's study. And in fact, Dr. Sweeney, who is a colleague of mine, does not use typically chemotherapy in patients with low volume disease. However, I would offer that the numbers were smaller because this enrollment was later for this subset of patients and that in time it is likely that benefit will become statistically significant based on where it's landing in the forest plot. 
the Stampede data, uh, which uh, an eloquent study by Nick James and colleagues in Europe, uh, is now completed enrollment in the AR agent uh, category. And as everyone, I think, uh, recognizes that this group of patients uh, has uh, had benefit in regards to the addition of abiraterone. And I do not need to uh, uh, go into great detail, but essentially there was benefit in overall survival, more notably in metastatic disease, but the, the, the plot, uh, the, the graph is pulling apart here at the end in people with non-metastatic disease, but failure-free survival was benefit, beneficial throughout the categories. And so I think it is also enticing to think about adding dual androgen uh, uh, deprivation therapy uh, in regards to patients with oligometastatic disease. In regards to the primary treatment, there is much less, uh, 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 there's a much smaller uh, database in regards to that. Uh, Suka Karamarian uh, in Europe has reported out a database of approximately 108 patients uh, who went for surgery, and most of these patients had metastatic disease. These, most of these patients did, had their prostatectomies as open prostatectomies. Uh, we can see the results of the surgery in that the majority did have positive margins and the majority had N1 disease at time of pathologic enhancement. And this is just a reporting out of the data that 11% had died of prostate cancer in 23 months and 10 of 12 deaths in the patients were due to skeletal metastasis. And approximately 15% of the patients required adjuvant or salvage radiation therapy. What cannot be uh, stated in this database is perhaps there will be an impact in quality of life. As we are doing a better job in controlling metastatic disease, often the area of first resistance can be within the pelvis, which could be horrifically morbid disease when it progresses. In regards to extended lymph node dissections uh, in regards to oligo oligometastatic disease, these were patients in which lymph nodes were detected on PET scan and then 32 out of 35 patients had a corresponding positive histopathology. However, the 12-month biochemical relapse-free survival was only 14% in the median time was only 3.4 months, lending to my statement that I did not see much utility in moving towards extended lymph node dissections in regards to patients who were discovered to have disease there in regards to uh, their advanced imaging. And finally, I'll end with the question of stereotactic radiosurgery in the presence of distant metastatic disease. This was 119 patients in this institutional analysis with 163 sites of disease. And they had, we measured radiographic disease progression-free survival, which was 21 months in patients treated with multi-area SBRT. But again, if we look at distant progression-free survival, we see a steady downward curve while the local progression-free survival rate was better. So my conclusions in oligometastatic prostate cancer. Intermittent ADT did not meet non-inferiority compared to continuous ADT. Adding docetaxel to ADT is not yet established as a standard of care, but may, uh, may do so in the near future. Adding abiraterone will likely be an accepted standard of care. Prostatectomy enhances local disease control, but no data to suggest impact on other parameters. Image-guided lymph node dissection does not appear to enhance long-term disease control. SBRT is intriguing. Further studies are underway, but I offer again that it probably will not enhance long-term disease control substantially, but will help with local disease control. So the decision on management is going to be an individualized clinical situation with patient preference and communication with our providers being 
very important in regards to our treatment algorithm. Uh, thank you very much. Membro do painel quer fazer algum comentário sobre a apresentação do Anthony Mega? Anthony, thank you for an excellent presentation. Uh, we in Brazil uh, have like a different uh, clinical uh, scenario because we do have PET with BSMA um, available at least in, in big centers in Rio and Sao Paulo, Brasilia. And we have been used it. Uh, I know it's not part of still the, the international guidelines, but it's a very sensitive uh, uh, tool, as you mentioned. Uh, you showed some retrospective data showing that maybe local therapies for this local regional relapses are not giving us long-term disease-free survival. Uh, I'm asking a very practical question. Do you use this kind of tools in your practice? And what has changed in terms of multidisciplinary team management of those patients when you find those local regional relapses? I, I will make a comment on uh, one point that you made in regards to the retrospective data, which I agree does not show that we are opening in January a multi-institutional perspective trial looking at, uh, in a more disciplined manner, the impact of local therapy in regards to many parameters, including overall survival. Now back to using the PET scan tool. We are using it in regards to biochemical relapse. We are only using it in, the, in clinical trials in regards to staging high risk or very high risk patients. What impact has it had? Um, uh, I had a conversation recently with Mary Ellen Taplin uh, uh, at the Dana Farber, and she said, and she offers a counterpoint. Why are we in a rush to diagnose incurable disease? Does it really impact how early we start medical therapy in regards to survival? Would in, not, but wouldn't it avoid you from doing a surgery that could have you know, consequences, complications, etc.? Right. I, I think not only this. There is another question, which is avoiding systemic therapy for a while. Maybe you are not curing patients, but you are avoiding hormone therapies for years in some of these guys, which is another endpoint. Without detecting your referring or? I mean, detecting early some relapses can give you the option of local therapies and avoiding systemic therapy oh, for a while. if you have a local recurrence detected yes. by imaging. Yes, yes. And, and so I, 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 in regards to the avoiding of primary treatment, it would make more sense that we start using these in very high-risk patients. And that's, that's not a place where we have FDA uh, approval. Um, our insurance industry is very regulated now in the United States. It would be very difficult for us to obtain any of this advanced imaging outside of the FDA-approved area. But I do agree that that would be a more enticing place. In regards to the avoidance of systemic therapy, that is a very good point. Systemic therapy uh, ha has substantial morbidity. Uh, we talked earlier about the sarcopenia, et cetera. And that is, I think, the concept here of the prospective trial. Because I think if the prospective trial speaks to the fact that it does have that sort of impact, then the imaging to define people as oligometastatic, I think would be more impactful. Right now, unfortunately, we, as I said, we have, uh, we have data that gives us questions uh, that, um, that challenges us to do now new prospective trials to try to answer those questions. Algum comentário mais? Okay. So another uh, practical question. So let's say you have a patient uh, newly diagnosed with a high PSA and only one bone lesion on uh, uh, imaging studies. So how would you approach that patient? I mean, you would probably offer ADT, but would you offer a bradron or would you offer intermittent therapy or, and irradiate the lesion 
I mean, in your clinic, how would you approach that patient? Asymptomatic patient, Asy right? Completely asymptomatic. Yeah, you're going to make him miserable, that's for sure. Okay, yeah. Anthony, go ahead. Well, See what you're going to um, do with the guy. We do. We have a uh, we have a multidisciplinary clinic with urologists joining us, and our urology colleagues would want to manage those patients' local disease. Think about the fact that the local disease is the first disease, and it is more likely to have mutational progression, uh, perhaps before a low volume metastatic site. So I think there's good rationale to to still offer directed therapy, uh, systemic therapy, but not indefinite androgen deprivation therapy, and perhaps, I do think, an addition uh, of a second agent for a defined period of time, but also management of uh, local disease. In a patient that has a performance status and a lack of comorbidities to suggest that he would have premature uh, uh, mortality. Now that we, we have available PSMA PET scans, we are seeing very challenging cases. I so let's say, so yeah, so we are, we are now seeing patients with locally advanced disease, like high risk localized disease with negative uh, 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 metastases on regular uh, scans like CT and bone scan. Mm -hmm. And then a patient get a, a PSMA PET scan and he had like one bone lesion. So what would you do with that patient? I mean, with the standard imaging, you would probably offer a radical prostatectomy or radiation and hormones. But now he had, but now he, so now we're facing the stage in migration uh, problem that we have to, to handle. So, but that's an, uh, that's the challenge in, in handling um, advances in imaging uh, before any validated database. Um, and, and so I, I think that is what I prepare my patients for before they even get a PET scan, um, that there's likely going to be ambiguity rather than clarity on what to do next. I can't answer your question directly. All I can do is commiserate that I have been in the same place. Yeah. But understand, let's go back 10 seconds on the, on the case. I just saw a very similar case. I mean, there's an issue of local control. It has to be addressed. No one wants a patient with prostate cancer with an uncontrolled pelvic area, severe pain, bleeding, etc. So one could argue, maybe I would consider doing a BOLA-like, LHLH analog plus RT, and, and there are some people that are enthusiastic about SBRT and start hitting everything that you can actually see. Um, do you think that would be too much, reasonable, or you would just basically would say, you know, I'm not going to do anything. You're asymptomatic, you are incurable, and I'll let you enjoy your life. What would you do? I mean, patient just saw and paid your counsel, so you got to say something, right? Yes. And uh, so we got to, Anthony, you got to say something. I'm going to do this. Well, I would do, uh, I, I would do local therapy, absolutely. Absolutely do local therapy. Uh, and, uh, and, and not only that, that is what my practice is. SBRT to oligometastatic sites, um, I, I do not think that we should do that with the expectation that systemic therapy should be eliminated. Okay. We're going to have one, I think we're going to have two. You have one, one point. Yeah. Uh, I'm always worried about what telling the patient about proposing uh, for oligometastatic. Now in Brazil, we're just treating uh, patients with uh, lymph nodes that usually would not be resected. The patient has a, had a prostatectomy and it made the PET PSMA and showed some lymph nodes that can be resected. And what do you tell your patients? Because you, you can tell the patient that he's could be cured uh, with the surgery or even if you do SBRT. What do you tell your patients about it? I can tell you what I did tell them and what I'm now telling them based on clinical observation. I used to tell them uh, that uh, we will do these scans and if we detect only local therapy, we could potentially avoid systemic therapy long term with either SBRT or extended lymph node dissections. I have a very active surgical group, and they do robotic lymph node dissections, and that was more commonly 
what we did rather than uh, rather than SBRT. However, my while I do not start systemic therapy uh, uh, immediately after local therapy, I do prepare my patients that that more likely than not, based on retrospective data, that they will be on systemic therapy within a one to two year period of time. We're going to have to move on. Antonia, would you kindly start the case discussion, please? Yes. Yeah, isso abre para a audiência também. Quem quiser fazer perguntas, por favor, ou comentários. Antonia, please. So the case discussion is hopefully going to be interactive as we move along in the case. Please ask any questions uh, in regards to the case. And I would love to uh, have the panel discuss uh, these sort of uh, controversial points of uh, of discussion. So our objectives are to review the current state of metastatic prostate cancer, understand therapeutic options in metastatic castrate sensitive prostate cancer, specifically focus on the use of enzalutamide as a first line therapy, and a point that is very, very important to me uh, in my career has been uh, the promotion of integrative care in the management of prostate cancer. I pulled uh, this data uh, in this somewhat difficult slide to see. However, fortunately, Brazil is on the top line because I was interested in what the trends are in regards to prostate cancer incidence in Brazil. And you could see that the growth, unfortunately, is uh, greater in Brazil than many parts uh, of, of the world. Uh, perhaps that is uh, more a uh, function of screening uh, in earlier detection. Uh, however, it was nice to see that mortality did not trend with uh, incidence and that uh, mortality rates are declining in Brazil. So, our case study, we will discuss the initial presentation of a hormone-sensitive metastatic patient, the presentation of metastatic castrate-resistant disease, and an example of what integrative management as opposed to a single discipline managing the patient. So Alberto is a 62-year-old fisherman. And uh, I would like, uh, I, I come from a fishing community, and so uh, I'll, I'll, and I, in, in southeastern New England uh, has a lot of Portuguese immigrants. So Alberto uh, was a, a fisherman uh, uh, from Portugal, uh, and he presented in this manner. Uh, he's a 62-year-old man. His past medical history of hypertension and peripheral neuropathy uh, he was on gabapentin and lisinopril. Uh, he presents uh, to an urgent care center uh, with pain in his pelvis that was limiting his work. In his images showed sclerotic bone disease, his PSA 156, in a bone scan that was markedly positive for axial appendicular metastasis. He did not have visceral or lymph node metastasis. And these are his imaging studies, which show areas of sclerosis here compared to his other side. This does not, in this light, show up very well. But we can easily see a bone scan that is markedly positive. And this is obviously not a man with oligometastatic disease. And this is clearly what's driving his pelvic pain. So this is, by definition, high volume disease, um, and uh, it, it is prognostically different, and the, there will be management uh, changes as a result of that. But I have gone through the definition, and I won't reiterate. This is similar to a study that uh, was just uh, presented. This is Gandaglia's study uh, uh, from European Oncology that reiterates that lymph node, bone, visceral, in descending order of prognosis. And I agree, when we speak of visceral metastasis, that liver metastasis are distinctly a poorer prognostic group than patients with lung metastasis. In fact, patients with lung metastasis really have many pulmonary symptoms at the onset. 
what is the prognosis of, uh, we are often asked by our patients uh, who are diagnosed with metastatic prostate cancer, doctor, what do you think? Uh, what is my prognosis? And I would offer that when we look at um, the group of high uh, volume patients uh, and go back to some of our recent large clinical trials that we, we're better able to answer that with sort of the traditional standard of care of prognosis of approximately three and a half years. Although with new advancements of care, I think we feel pretty good that we're moving that curve further and further to the right. Now, this is difficult to see, but again, this is a reiteration that people with visceral METs do worse than people with uh, lymph node METs, patients with higher Gleason scores, older patients, and people with worse uh, 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 performance status have a worse prognosis. So perhaps an example of non-integrative care, if a patient was uh, initially referred ref referred perhaps to just a uh, urologist, would be that he undergoes his core biopsies, Gleason 9 disease, he has started on androgen deprivation therapy, and he is given opiates for his painful hip metastasis. With an integrative care model, we would establish the diagnosis, and I still think there is benefit in doing that, although I think the clinical situation stated that the pretest probability was very high that this was prostate cancer that a medical oncologist, radiation oncologist, and urologist are involved in the assessment that we're not just given opiates, but we're given an appropriate bowel regimen, that we are trying to give the patient immediate pain release, uh, relief and considering palliative radiation therapy to his painful hip metastasis, and we're considering either chemo-hormonal therapy or uh, ADT uh, with an androgen receptor agent. So let's, uh, we have uh, alluded to uh, chartered and stampede, uh, and let's look at it specifically in the context of chemotherapy with docetaxel. Uh, there is an overall survival benefit with chemo hormonal therapy as initial management for hormone sensitive patients. There is a delay to castrate resistant, and I have already pointed out there is some danger to extrapolate to patients with low volume disease and lymph node positive disease at this time, but certainly encouraging trend lines. This is, again, the forest plot of the uh, Dr. Sweeney data, which really showed virtually a benefit in all categories in regards to receiving docetaxel at 75 milligrams per meter squared. Uh, the primary objective uh, was to test the uh, hypothesis that overall survival would be impacted, and in fact it was, and we could see already moving that curve to the right, 44 months to 57 months, often something that I explained to patients, the rationale for doing chemotherapy. Although one of the interesting data points that I will like to see evaluated, and we are tracking this, we have a standard way of presenting patients in regards to chemotherapy. We are still finding that even when we present a benefit, that approximately a third of men refuse chemotherapy at the onset. So, I, 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 so again, here is our survival benefit, as I said, 57 to 44 months. And again, the stampede, this was a two to one to one to one randomization. This was the one that also uh, used uh, zoledronic acid. We should state right at this onset that uh, for uh, benefit for patients uh, with castrate sensitive disease, I would offer that skeletal protective therapy may have a role in regards to preventing osteoporosis and bone mineral density loss. However, it does not have a survival benefit or a benefit in delaying skeletal-related events. But there was a benefit, similar benefit, that we saw to chemotherapy. Now, we do see that the median overall survival times went from 71 to 81 months. Now, why, is those, why are those numbers higher in the Stampede trial? Because there were less patients with high-volume disease and more patients with either 
uh, low volume disease in these patients, ex this study accepted patients with no positive disease or biochemical relapses. And just for a counterpoint, the JTUG study out of France uh, did not show a benefit of chemotherapy. Uh, this was a much smaller study and probably included a, a cohort of patients that were prognostically better from the onset. So the bottom line, as I see it, is that chemotherapy for, ca for castrate-sensitive prostate cancer Absolutely yes for high volume disease. I believe yes in regards to castrate sensitive and low volume disease. And it's not a place that I would say is, should be offered as a standard of care for patients with pro, post prostatectomy, no disease or biochemical M0 disease. I, I'd like to make this a first starting point and at least ask my panel uh, in the context uh, of uh, the uh, previous uh, data with docetaxel and the uh, newly uh, released data with abiraterone, then how are we approaching patients with castrate-sensitive metastatic prostate cancer? Okay, vamos começar o Daniel para cá, por favor. Daniel, está com o microfone. I truly believe this both are strong data, uh, strong. Uh, articles with a great benefit. I'm always concerned a little bit about how those patients were managed after the first uh, study was done in terms of second and third line therapies. And in all these studies, uh, you see that some of these patients didn't receive the amount of treatment that they supposed to, to receive. It was true for the, the charter study, it was true for the Stampede study, and I think this is a very strong argument uh, how you can approach patients. I always tell patients uh, how important this data is, and I, I agree with you that many patients don't like to, give, to receive chemotherapy. I'm not sure in the second question if I answer, I believe yes, I will say probably I'm not sure, and I don't give to most of my patients, especially for the low volume uh, disease. Uh, so I, I completely agree with you. Uh, in the low volume patients, if the patient is young and understand the risks and benefits, I often offer them uh, docetaxel. But now that we have data on abiraterone, my main uh, doubt is for the third group of patients, the post prostatectomy with uh, node positive disease, uh, and and also patients that are undergoing a radiation and hormones for a locally advanced disease, uh, if I should offer them abiraterone or no. Because for the, the other two groups, I would probably offer abiraterone. Yeah, I agree as well. I, I think that maybe uh, patients with low volume disease, as you said, and probably the novo disease as well, what happens is that you are facing the patient at different moments of the disease that the high volume so probably you had to wait a little bit more to see the data showing survival benefit, but I agree. I used to do chemotherapy for the majority of the patients who present with MU metastatic prostate cancer. But nowadays with abiraterol data, I used to discuss with the patient and individual the case. Can I, can I ask a question? Can I ask you a question? May I? Yeah. Um, at this ESMO meeting, there were two presentations on comparisons between NABI and, and Docetex. So one was a meta-analysis trying to compare the data, and the other one was a stampede data comparing different arms, Docetex arm with abiraterone arm. In both studies, it seems that abiraterone was a little bit better, uh, not in overall survival, but in some uh, intermediate endpoints. How do you uh, feel with this kind of comparisons? Well, first of all, it didn't surprise me when I saw that data that abiraterone, as far as uh, disease progression-free survival, was better because abiraterone is a continuous therapy. And, and it's intriguing in the context of how patients make decisions because sometimes patients choose chemotherapy over abiraterone because of the concept of not 
wanting to be on the therapy for two to three years and also being on prednisone, albeit at yet a lower dose at two and a half milligrams twice per day. So it, it, it does not, it did not surprise me uh, because of the continued therapy in using abiraterone that it would have an impact on progression-free survival. Okay. Let's move on just in the interest of time, Anthony, please. Yes. So his prostate cancer journey, um, he received ADT uh, with an LHRH agonist, and uh, he uh, declined dosi taxol because he did have existing neuropathy, uh, and there was not a discussion at that time about abiraterone, given this case predated that. Ten months later, his PSA is 3, and 13 months later, it is now 29. So he is a relatively early cash rate resistant presentation. And I, I will not belabor uh, uh, the, the mechanisms because uh, this has already uh, been reviewed for the sake of time. But I will speak to, uh, in regards to the points in which enzalutamide uh, mechanistically uh, uh, benefits patients in cash rate resistant disease. So think about enzalutamide as this triple therapy in regards to inhibiting binding to the androgen receptor of the uh, DHT ligand. It inhibits the nuclear translocation that is necessary to then lead to DNA binding transcription, which leads to proliferation and a lack of apoptosis. So uh, in his uh, non-integrative uh, journey, he has bicalutamide added. But if he's then moved into an integrative setting, we consider discontinuation of bicalutamide if he was on it. Uh, we uh, confirm that the testosterone is castrate. Uh, he undergoes radiation therapy again to painful sites. And then we discuss the treatment options for minimally symptomatic castrate-resistant prostate cancer. And these are our systemic options uh, that would fall into acceptable options uh, uh, for this patient. Uh, First-generation antiandrogen therapy, which I think has now evolved as unacceptable, enzalutamide, apiraterone, docetaxel, the use of a, a, one of the first immunotherapies that was approved, CYP-T, and radium-223. And what influences our decision uh, in regards to our discussion with the patient? Well, obviously, there's always a focus on efficacy. Uh, we would like the next agent to not only be beneficial, but be beneficial for a durable period of time. We look at adverse effects. Uh, these are patients who are likely going to be on an agent for a long period of time. And what toxicities does the agent present and the patient potentially experiences? How do medical comorbidities affect? We see in this patient, he had peripheral neuropathy. And that influences our decision to use an agent such as docetaxel. For a patient point of view, the ease of administration, the availability, and certainly what we deal with a lot is the potential cost financially and economically to a patient in our healthcare system. So what determines efficacy? And while survival, overall survival, is always a primary outcome data point, it does not represent a sole uh, measurement of efficacy as I indicated here and not to be put at the bottom because of a lack of importance, is symptom management. So Alberto has a discussion with his oncologist in the care team. He is fearful of prednisone therapy, uh, as it may potentially make him diabetic. Uh, he wishes an oral therapy with a favorable side effect profile, and he's informed that enzalutamide is preferable compared to bicalutamide and he has started on Xtandi at 160 milligrams per day. And let's look at some of the data that is pertinent to this particular decision. So there are two randomized clinical trials that I think answer many questions that Alberto could have in regards to his treatment. The PREVAIL trial uh, is a trial 
uh, that was done prior to docetaxel chemotherapy in patients with castrate-resistant prostate cancer using standard definitions. And it was a randomization to enzalutamide versus placebo uh, in patients asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic. And 35 to 31 month median survival difference. The hazard ratio, however, was a very robust 0.77 or a 23% reduction in mortality over time observed and a very high statist statistical p-value. And when we do the subgroup analysis, this is the line that indicates one. We can see that most of the subgroups are below, are, 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 are below one in regards to their, uh, in, in regards to their uh, ratios. Um, and looked at geographic area, age, performance status, and visceral metastasis. That outcome of relative, uh, that, of, of progression-free survival benefit, a therapy that is durable, that is going to work. And so we can see that uh, there's a substantial benefit in lowering progression over placebo, not very survival, not, not very survive, uh, uh, surprising given that we didn't think placebo would be active, uh, but substantial activity with enzalutamide and that not yet reach was the uh, median progression-free survival at the time of the uh, publication for Prevail. And again, the subgroup analysis really showed benefit in all the previously noted subgroups. Another subgroup analysis looking at some of those predictive markers, uh, prognostic markers, PSA, LDH, hemoglobin, uh, also show benefit uh, in a very consistent fashion. Now I'm going to switch gears because there was a thought in regards to offering this patient bicalutamide therapy. And why not? Bicalutamide has been around for years. Uh, it is generic. It is relatively easy to administer. And so it's often a consideration. But our patients need to know that progression-free survival is inferior with bicalutamide, 15 months versus 5.8 months in a randomized clinical trial on castrate-resistant prostate cancer. The TERRAIN trial had a unique aspect in regards to the fact that the comparator was an active agent rather than placebo. Uh, again, uh, uh, progression-free survival, this now looking at it from a radiographic standpoint, much better in regards to enzalutamide as compared to bicalutamide, uh, where uh, not yet reach versus 16 months. And how about the duration of therapy? So we're going to flip back now to the PREVAIL trial. And, and as I stated, there should be an expectation uh, as we present uh, these options to patients, that is something that they will be on for a long period of time. Because if we look here at Prevail, it was 16.6 months, in that two-thirds of the patients remained on therapy for greater than a year. So it's a consideration, regardless of which, which agent you're selecting, whether you're selecting abiraterone with prednisone, whether you're selecting enzalutamide, that there will be a relatively long duration of therapy. As we have uh, iterated here this morning, that uh, while we see benefits with chemotherapy, uh, it is relatively common that a patient preference is to avoid chemotherapy. This is, again, the PREVAIL trial. And we can see time to chemotherapy uh, is delayed in people in this solid gold line receiving enzalutamide compared to placebo. Patients like to see PSAs go down, and so do providers. Um, and we can see the, uh, the plot here showing that most of the patients can expect a relatively robust PSA response uh, if they receive enzalutamide compared to the patients receiving placebo in the PREVAIL trial. And in fact, 78% of patients had a greater than 50% decline 
in PSA. Well, how about the active comparator by colutamide? And again, we can see a substantial benefit as we look at this plot in regards to enzalutamide with an 82%, a relatively similar rate, versus a 21% greater than 50% decline in PSA. Similar to PSA time to progression in the PREVAIL trial, a benefit of enzalutamide over placebo. And the same as we're seeing in the TERRAIN trial, 19 months versus 5.8 months in the placebo arm. Our patient had skeletal disease, but how about patients with soft tissue disease? Should we expect less? The answer is no, that there's still substantial benefit in enzalutamide over placebo in patients with soft tissue disease. We noted that quality of life, um, while not often a discussion point at the onset of choosing therapy, will become a discussion point throughout therapy, because that's where you are balancing off the potential adverse effects of therapy versus the benefit of delaying disease progression. And I, I, I won't go through all these different acronyms, but the gold bars all represent uh, patients improving quality of life outcomes in regards to them receiving enzalutamide, comparing it to placebo. When we speak to our patients, uh, they uh, often will want our, dis our uh, discussion in regards to adverse effects. And we can see in both arms that there were adverse re effects uh, uh, noted. And I'm sure in the placebo arm, this represented uh, disease progression. The serious adverse effects were 32% in the enzalutamide arm versus 27% in the placebo arm. Um, and that the adverse effect, effect event leading to death by the evaluators was 4% in both arms. We won't go through this point by point, but I will point out some of the ones that I think are noteworthy. We'll start here with fatigue, which was 35% with enzalutamide versus 25% with placebo, all grades but greater than three, uh, gray, uh, greater than three fatigue uh, by the ECOG stale was only 1.8%. I do alert the possibility of hypertension. Alberto was on lisinopril, and Alberto's hypertension uh, could get worse at a rate of 13%. And, I, and when I go to terrain, we're seeing a similar rate. So I'm going to end uh, his prostate cancer journey with the fact that he received Xtandi. His PSA declined uh, to 1.4, 14 months in tr to treatment. His PSA uh, uh, in, uh, then goes, starts going up. He is symptom-free. And the question of whether he should stop, stop this therapy or continue it is the point where I'll end for discussion. Temos só dois minutinhos aqui. Se alguém quiser fazer alguma pergunta ou comentário para o Dr. Mega. Ok, Dennis, one question only. Uh, microphone, please. Uh, can you get this microphone over here? Dá para o médico? Obrigado. So, only one last question and we're done. Uh, I would just... Ok, I can ask in English. I would just... You mentioned about the oligometastatic prostate cancer. I would like to hear considerations about the oligoprogressive prostate cancer. Like Alberto, if he progresses on PSA and like one or two lesions, he's tolerating pretty well the treatment. Would you consider irradiating that lesions with SRS? So, and continue with enzalutamide. So, just radiate areas that are escaping the uh, treatment. I, I will say to you absolutely yes. Uh, that is something that we commonly employ uh, in oligometastatic uh, progression. Um, especially in patients who are tolerating uh, therapy well. Um, it's straightforward, obviously, if a patient is symptomatic at that site, uh, because obviously symptom improvement uh, will occur. But I also think there's rationale um, based on the fact that 
uh, we may be able to continue a beneficial therapy. I do think it points out to intrapatient heterogeneity of disease based on those mechanisms of resistance uh, that we discussed. And so another point is biopsy and sites of progression in determining what mutation, what is the mutational status to perhaps predict what the next therapy should be. Excellent. Dr. Mega, thank you very much. Uh, we have to leave the room. Unfortunately, it was outstanding. Very, very helpful. Thank you indeed. Obrigado a todos pela atenção.